Oh, good evening, everybody. It is Thursday, February 15th, and welcome to episode 160 of Buds and Blue Jays, your place for all things related to the Toronto Blue Jays. I'm Jesse Burrell, joined by Riley McConnell, and we are live on both Twitter and Facebook. So please, if you are watching along, like the video, leave a comment, share, tell with a friend. It's baseball season, guys. Pitchers and catchers have officially reported. We are excited. We are buzzing. We're going to get into all the news that came out of Dunedin, Florida today, and a lot of big things from Media Day, including getting our first look at a lot of the players that came on here as well. In our second half of the episode, we're going to take a look at the farm, look at some of the prospects that may be coming to the Toronto Blue Jays this year. But first, Riley, Pitchers and catchers reported it is officially baseball season. I couldn't be more excited. How about you, man? As we know, on Sunday, the Kansas City Swifts won the Super Bowl. So yep. that means, hey, next thing that's on the list, baseball. It's baseball season. I know mm-hmm, it's midway mm-hmm. through February. Pitchers and catchers are in the nice sunny state of Florida. And for our Toronto Blue Jays, it feels good. We're, uh, we got to look at the guys, you know, coming into the complex. And it's it's just nice to see the guys walk in. I mean, a lot of returning faces to the Toronto Blue Jays, guys who haven't been there a while. And, um, you know, I'm hoping to probably mesh some chemistry. I think chemistry is, you know, important in baseball. And, you know, I hope that this is a good spring for everyone. I hope the next couple of weeks are enjoyable for everybody. Um, it's a good look, man. It's a It's a good time. In baseball, it's a good time to even even if you weren't paying attention, you know, a couple weeks back with baseball, that was a good time. Even the casual guy to tune in, and you, you know, you'll catch some good news every now and again because I mean, it's going to be put up or shut up for the Jays. I mean, as of right mm-hmm. now, like we're we're not going to break any records. Uh, we might not even break 500. So I mean, we're optimistic. Moves uh, could still be made, but as of right now, it's looking like. The team that's entering Florida in, in at the complex in Dunedin, uh, this is this might be the team that uh, we're sending out to spring training and then cracking down with 26 guys to start the season. It looks like it, man. I don't know about you, Riley, and we've been talking all offseason about our little pessimism for the Toronto Blue Jays, but it's spring training. Every single team has the same record. You don't know. Maybe this is the season things get magical and things can go on a run. And I want to start, Riley, by getting our first look at some of the Toronto Blue Jays who came onto this team this year. And I have a little video here. of um, This is courtesy of Hazel May on Twitter. Uh, she does a great job going through and walking through these Toronto Blue Jays coming into the stadium. So if you're watching on YouTube, you'll be able to see it. But the first one here, we have Jose Brios walking in, looking good. He's going to have a monster year this year. I'm very excited. Riley, Bo Bichette. I know you have a lot on Bo Bichette. Oh, dude, Bo Bichette is is a guy that's going to get a ton of hits this year. Like 200, not in the bag yet, but uh, mm-hmm. he's, he, if, you know, stays healthy, he's got a great chance of doing it. Bowden Francis looks sharp. Here comes Santiago Espinal rocking the Adidas sweater. I kind of like that. Love he's got the a hat. guy something to prove. Love yep. the hat on uh, on uh, Espinal, the old throwback JT kind of 2008 alternate hat. Mm-hmm. That's nice. Along with uh, Garcia and Horowitz here coming into the complex. So yeah, like it's a superstar like Bo, there's even, you know, guys like Horowitz coming into camp. So it's good to see everyone. Yep. Attend. It's going to see everyone. Chad Green and Trevor Richards coming in here. They're uh, Chad Green's the only one in a t-shirt. So do with that. Oh, as I say that, and here's Isaiah kind of left our first. Yeah, the well, guy. he's got the Rocking new beard. beard. Keep him warm. He's, he, he's mm-hmm. warm with the beard, man. Nate Pearson coming through. Always very excited to see what big Nate can do. I remember spring trainings of past where Nate Pearson was good. And then some guys in the back end of our pen that are going to be electric. Eric Swanson might have some of the best splitter. Sipping on a nice little Starbucks coffee there. And then our guy, Yusei Kikuchi. All smiles. Way. All smiles, Yusei Kikuchi. That is his his attitude, uh, you know, tr- changed drastically from the year in 2022 to 2023. Uh, he was a new man last year. And I love to see a guy walk in excited, ready to go. He's already been working. You say Kikuchi, right? We showed that already. He's been mm-hmm. squatting. You know, we uh, that one video where we were looking at his backside there for about a minute and a half as he's doing he's doing squats or deadlifts. Yep. So uh, I'm excited for Kikuchi. I know you said Brios is going to have a great year, which he is. Kikuchi, I don't think people realize that he, there's a really good chance that he shines and has another fantastic year this year in 2024. 
All right, man, I am excited. Let's get into some of the big news that did happen here and some of the quotes that came out because this is the first time the media has been able to talk to the players as well. And this is the first time guys like John Schneider, Ross Atkins, some of the players have really been in contact here. And I want to start this episode by going over a quote, uh, two quotes actually, one by our manager, John Schneider, and one by Kevin Gosman. And that was basically about how things ended last year and how they used that loss in Minnesota to come up and help prepare themselves better for this season. And this one is um, what John Schneider said. He's like, when you fall short of your goal like you did last year, you look at yourself in the mirror and say, okay, what can we do differently? And that's kind of the majority of the plan they've been talking about all summer. And then this is what Kevin Gosman said. He said, quote, there was a lot of positives and obviously it sucks how last season ended, but I feel like a lot of the fans uh, forget to look at the good things and they see things in a negative way. It's water under the bridge. We've got to turn the page this season. Riley, how do you feel after hearing those two quotes from our ace and from our manager, John Schneider? Well, we'll start with the words of uh, Kevin Gosman and that's for him to say that's very, very humbling, but he was certainly not the issue. Uh, why we fell short of even a, a playoff series victory or that for that mm -hmm. a playoff win victory. It came down to the offense. Gosman was absolutely fantastic. Um, very, a, a very young manager in John Schneider. Um, you know, it's, it's hard to find real success. You know, if you want to label the Blue Jays as kind of a mid-tier team last year, I think that's fine. Um, you know, I don't know if the best manager in baseball takes that team to the world series. Uh, you know, we've, we've used this kind of analogy, uh, on, on our show before, and basically kind of the manager just kind of just there to babysit a good team will run itself in a lot of ways and kind of decide, you know, there's not a, you know, the NL managers, they don't have to decide who to pinch hit for, for the pitcher. I mean, we have DHs now. It basically comes down to who we warming up in the bullpen, who's coming up, situational things. You know, there were some steals last year, I guess, uh, with the uh, with the rule changes and the bases getting bigger. Yep. Managers do have a job to do, but a lot of the time it's on the players. And mm -hmm. I think we know where the issues were last year. And those, I, I think it goes without saying the pitching was great. Gosman was definitely not the reason. And it's not a, let's point the finger at, one person, let's say that um, I think the team just needs to kind of click at the same time, even through the regular season last year. A lot of guys were hot and it showed, but the team was not hot at that time. And therefore, one guy is not going to win the ball game for you. One out of nine guys hitting in that order. You know, you can't win the game with one guy. You got to have a couple guys clicking and, and some well-rounded, uh, you know, pitching and defense to go with that, too. So. I just, I just hope guys can gel at the same time. You're not going to win 162 games. Uh, for us to even win 90 games at this point with what's in front of us from how we played last year is, is still a pretty steep task. I certainly think we can do it, but we're going to need a lot out of our players. In fact, I believe that to do that, you know, Varsho needs to do things that we think Dalton Varsho should be able to mm -hmm. do. He's going to have to reach his ceiling, and Vlad's going to have to go back to that caliber of player. And mm -hmm. I mean, George Springer can't regress that much if, if we're going to mm -hmm. go that far and say, let's be honest. All that big way, factors for sure. There's there's a ton of variables to go in in deciding how to win baseball games because you're again, I say nine guys. Well, there's 26 guys, and not all 26 guys who start the year are going to end the year or play this. Mm -hmm. You know, we're not going to have the same roster on, let's say, July 24th. Injuries, things like that can change all that. So, I mean, it is on the players and, and they know that. And it's, it's good to see them roll into camp because now it's time to get ready. I'm excited. It for is, this year, it Jesse. Is. I, I know you are, man. Mm -hmm. We got a lot. We got a big show. We got a big show to get to man and a ton, yeah. a ton to talk about, man. Let's hear. Yeah. It. So let's just dive right into some of the news coming out of camp. The first one, the, really the main one that I took away from this was, um, they talked about what they're going to do at second base. I mentioned Kevin Biggio, Santiago Espinal, Isaiah kiner Falefa. Between what are we going to do at second and third base? John Schneider described it as, quote, a cool puzzle to solve. Do you have a 30 seconds or less a take on that? Wow, cool puzzle. cool puzzle to solve. Are we going to put the big piece of Turner outside it? I see right now he's just pretty much listed as a DH. I think mm -hmm. Isaiah kiner Falefa is probably going to get some time in a third. Same with Biggio. Um, and again, I, I think Davis Schneider, if he if he comes out swinging, 
in, in spring training, I want to see David Schneider get as many reps and as many at-bats in Major League time as possible, man. Get a, full -time, those... get a full time second baseman. I think that's important. Sure. But speaking of those two things you just mentioned there, um, well, David Schneider was asked about what he went through in the offseason, and he said he'll be focused a lot on playing either second base or left field. So those seem to be the two spots David Schneider is going to play. Maybe platoon with Varsho, where you can move Varsho to center, and Kiermaier sits on the bench. That seems to be the tentative plan from John Schneider so far. And you mentioned Justin Turner in that mix there, too. Um, John Schneider also said, quote, he will be so he'll be hitting somewhere in the lineup where he's doing damage in the middle of the order, most likely, which is what we predicted from Justin Turner when we signed here. And he's going to DH and he's going to play first and third quote a little bit. So that's kind of right in line of where we think that could be. Yeah. So let's say 140 games. We'll go five games at third, 10 games there. That's a lot of time at DH, man. I, I don't expect mm -hmm. him with, I don't expect Vadi to have a ton of days off this year. Um, and when he, when he is at a first base, I would think that he would be DH in quite a bit as well. Pressure is on then for Justin Turner, because if he is our full-time DH, he's got to hit like a full-time DH. We will talk about that a little later on because we have so much more to get to coming out of camp. One of the bigger takeaways, and we talked about a little bit off season, Riley is Alec Manoa is back and he actually looks pretty good. There's a first report that he's down about 30 pounds. Um, he actually looks healthy. There was some stuff of him throwing. Now, I can't see the results. I do not know what the velocity was. I do not know what the slider movement was on there, but he did seem to look pretty good. In fact, Pete Walker was on um, Blair and Barker, and he was talking about Alec Manoa, and he said he's quite confident that Alec Manoa and the things that made him good was his will that he wants to be great and he wants to be excellent on the mound is going to come back a lot this year. I think I know from experience, when you go through a big weight loss journey, your confidence comes back, you feel good, you feel like it can happen. And if Alec Manoa has all that back and the stuff is still there to prove he can be effective, this could be a good sign for the player we're probably paying the most attention to all spring training. If we want to put last season on his on his weight, I think that's fine. But we can't make that de that decision yet until we see how how mm -hmm. this, this year's version of him pitches. And... Uh, and I, I would not be surprised if he returned and he is better. But is he, Jesse, is he going to be what he was in 2022, which was a top three Cy Young pitcher? Yeah, I, I think it's hard to it, expect that. It is so hard to expect that, man, because he even looked back in 2021, where basically if he gets five more starts, he's rookie of the year. Um, mm -hmm. He did absolutely incredible the first year and a half of his MLB career, and then all of a sudden, boom. So it's so funny because it could go so many different ways. I doubt that he falters like he did last year, but at the same time, too, I would not get your hopes set too high on, on him, you know, being a, a Cy Young right out of the gate. There is still a chance to get that back. The likelihood still very, very low, and that's going through any at any point in his career. Because he still has a mountain to climb at this point. If I were to put the over-under right now for Alec Manoa's ERA next season at, let's go 385. Are you thinking it's going to be higher than that or is it going to be lower than that? I'm going up. I have his ERA ranked in the 410s, I think is what okay. I, would, I, would, I would put it there. So better than last season, but still not the ace level guy we think could be in there. I think I agree with you, Riley. I think Alec Manoa is going to show shines. He's going to have flashes of his dominance. I think he's also going to have some starts this year where even though he is more confident, he's still going to get roughed up a little bit. He'll be your fifth starter and he'll be projected like every single way a good fifth starter should be. I just agree. I'd be happy if we got that ace level pitcher back, but it's, it's really hard to see it going unless he has a massive spike in velocity this spring, or he gets that slider back or he learns a new trick or something along those lines. And a new good trick for him to learn would be to regain control of that strike zone because the walks were just getting yes. ridiculous. And we know even if he isn't the strikeout artist, he was, you can change that with, with control and in becoming a more pitch to contact type pitcher. You know, we've seen a lot of successful pitchers do that. Um, I mean, that's a kind of an aging thing. Alec Manoa is not an aging guy with a, not a ton of MLB experience if you really crack down on it. So a lot of ways he can go. I'm not super optimistic. I'm more hopeful because I, I don't want to see a big blunder again. Last year was bad enough. Let's hope this is just mm -hmm. a skosh better because you can All only right, well, go off from here.
You can. That is the good news about such a down season is that it is only positive from here. Let's touch on the rest of the starting rotation. We know the main four between um, Gosman, Kikuchi, Barrios, and Bassett are all going to be there. But some of the starting pitching depth options that we talked about coming into spring have now been confirmed. Um, Bowden Francis and Mitch White are going to get stretched out. They're going to get long looks this spring. In that same interview where um, our pitching coach Pete Walker talked about Alec Manoa, he also mentioned Bowden Francis, and he said, quote, he is major league ready. Like, Bowden Francis is good. And I don't want you to forget in terms of stuff. Plus Bowden Francis um, was top five on the Blue Jays last year. He might even been top three. I'd have to go back and look at that. Very good stuff from Bowden Francis. We're going to get a good look from him this spring. And Yariel Rodriguez, who is the guy we got out of Cuba. He will come into camp as a starting pitcher, but the Blue Jays are going to be cautious because of the long layoff. Remember, he only pitched in the World Baseball Classic last year, didn't pitch any other time. And he's also having visa issues right now coming into camp, as well as our new third base coach, Car- uh, Carlos Bebles, is also dealing with some visa stuff. So they're going to be a little late to spring, which is never something you like to see, which might mean a triple-A start for Yariel Rodriguez once we get out of camp. I would not be surprised um, if all three of those guys ended up in triple A to start the year, Rodriguez, Francis, and Mitch White, White as well. Option. So you have to carry him on the big league roster or else you risk losing him to waivers. Well, that kind of sucks because we know how yeah. good he was in triple A last year. And that also, mm-hmm. we, if we if we have our, you know, rotation set, we'll, we'll say the five guys. Um, that also takes away a spot from a very good relief pitcher. We want to use, if we want to use Mitch White as a long relief guy, which I'm sure he would be just fine in that role. I really like our bullpen and, and options are a funny thing. I get that. This is how you don't hoard a ton of good guys in the minor leagues. Um, so yeah, I, okay. Knowing what I know now, Jesse, you know, the options I don't, but not with a guy like Mitch White anyway. So if he is on the major league club, you will see him. Uh, out of the long relief spot. And I'm sure he will at some mm-hmm. point make a start this year. Same with Bowden Francis. I don't know about Rodriguez, but I really hope he comes on strong. It would look really good. And it would look so smart as a Blue Jay signing. You know, he's not super, super young, but he's young enough and has enough international experience that he could be a very impactful piece uh, for the major league pitching staff. Yeah. So the fallout of those names, um, of them being, if Mitch White has to be in the bullpen, that means guys like Zach Pop, Hag and Danner, Yasver Zuleta, Nate Pearson are not making the opening day roster unless there is an injury, which spring training, this is the time injuries are going to happen. So you never know. Um, so keep that in mind. That'll be an interesting battle that we're going to watch for this spring. Um, speaking of injuries, things are not as bad as they are in Baltimore. I don't know if you've checked out Baltimore Orioles camp. Uh, Kyle Bradish just went down. Gunnar Henderson just had an injury. They are in trouble. The Blue Jays do have one, though, and that was with Kevin Biggio, who says to be dealing with left shoulder flashitis. Um, it seems like just rest and recovery is going to be the plan for Kevin Biggio. He is still in no risk of opening, uh, missing opening day, but um, keep an eye on that. Is you know, left hand to hitter, your left shoulder, it's important, and we want Kevin Biggio to be healthy. As we said, a lot of this offseason, he's going to be important. With that being said, in our middle infielder, Riley, one of the reporters asked John Schneider and Ross Atkins, do you see a chance if Orelvis Martinez or Addison Barger, two of the prospects we're going to talk about later in this episode, have a legit chance to make the opening day roster? Um, Ross Atkins says they are ready for an opportunity. It's an uphill battle. But if they come into spring training and light the world on fire, then they might force the issue. So a real good spring from Addison Barger or Orelvis Martinez could find their way on the opening day roster, which is something to pay attention to this spring. I really uh, like both of their chances to make the Toronto Blue Jays. However, I am kind of set in my ways with experience. And I really favor a guy like Addison Barger over a Ralvis Martinez. Um, I know that there's a lot of swing and miss in both their games. Um, I like probably the better defensive numbers that Barger is going to give you. I like the left-handed bat. And mm-hmm. I think I think that there's more to be kind of tapped in. I think with a guy like Aralvis Martinez, yes, there's a ton of pop in the bat, but I don't know if you convert that into the major leagues, you know, what kind of success that's going to do, or if you kind of crunch the numbers down and say, well, he hit for this average at, you know, double A and this in triple A, like what that, what's that going to convert to 
in the major leagues because if you're if you're batting an everyday 225 hitter who's lacking in pop then you don't really have much especially a guy who's you know probably going to be playing second base for you so i really like barger and we saw him last year in spring training jesse and how freaking good did he look man Barger oh, that leg kick and that swing is a thing of beauty. Yeah, I, mm -hmm. and I, I, and I'm really hoping to see more of the same this year. I think he's got a real good chance uh, to make the Blue Jays this year out of camp. And if not, first guy up as a position player, 100%. Yep, it would be good to see these guys uh, put together a good spring. We'll talk about these names a little bit more as we get later into the episode. Just a few more pieces of notes that came out in spring. First one is uh, Jordan Romano. He's focused on his delivery a little more this winter. Get a nice line to the plate. And when he does that, he says his velocity spikes up, which is good to see because the velocity from Jordan Romano has actually ticked down each of the last three seasons. So we want to see that number creep up. Um, Don Mattingly has a beard, Riley. Um no sideburns like in the Simpsons or whatever, um, but it's uh, it's a good look for Don Mattingly. I'm struggling to find a picture, but as soon as we find one, we'll throw it up on our Instagram handles. We'll throw it up on our Twitter feed. Make sure you go look at that for Don Mattingly. It's a thing of beauty. And I have one more quote. Someone did ask Ross Atkins about, um, is there another move coming? Is there something happening? We know there's still a lot of good free agents left on the board and still trade opportunities. Ross Atkins did say, he doesn't seem about making a major addition unless it takes something away from this roster, which you could look at that two ways. First one is that means he's working on a trade, which would make sense. If you get something, you have to give something away or it's going to be a payroll thing. If you make a move, you re-sign Chapman, you bring in Cody Bellinger, then you have to dump salary somewhere else. And it goes back to what we said a few episodes, Riley, the Blue Jays are going to stay under that luxury tax, which boy seems coming a long way from going to spending $700 million on Shohei Otani to now staying under this luxury tax. Um, do you have a takeaway on any of those three points of information? Yeah, well, we could have just deferred um, Shohei. Uh, <laughs> right. <in his> <laughs> uh, and I'm just going to go kind of off script here, Jesse. I can't wait. This MLB The Show is coming out real shortly. Um, mm -hmm. And I can't wait to go into franchise mode for the first time and see how mm -hmm. that contract is broken down in the game because there are no salary pe penalties. If you pick the Cincinnati Reds, Nowhere in that game where you find Ken Griffey Jr. on that payroll or Bobby Benilla on the New York Yeah, Mets. on the Mets. So how is this going to work with Shohei? Is it going to be $100 million or $70 million a year or whatever it would be? $70 million. I don't know what that's going to be like. Also, yeah, Mr. Burns uh, would absolutely hate Mattingly with, with a beard, <laughs> even though clearly Wade Boggs, as he's knocked out by Barney at Moe's, Wade Box mm -hmm. clearly had a beard. Mr. Burns, about 846 years old. He doesn't know what he's talking about. I do love The Simpsons and I love baseball. That's a great episode, by the way. Um, yeah. Best episode of The Simpsons all time. I guess it, we're still in off-season mode if we're talking Simpsons and baseball here. Oh, we're just doing good if we're talking about The Simpsons here 23 right. minutes into the episode. Our friend and old guest, uh, Jesse Teresa, wants to remind us of the power of the beards, and we agree. We've got a little bit of facial hair going on. We saw what happened with Yusei Kikuchi last season once he grew a beard. Isaiah kiner Falefa has a beard now? Interesting. Interesting. Especially after leaving New York with their uh, really dumb facial hair strategies. Kind of interesting to see. Uh, Riley, I do not know who Tate McRae is. Maybe it's because I'm 30 and uh, maybe it's a young person game, but the Blue Jays did open camp with a Tate McRae song. So whether or not the Blue Jays have a monster season this year or a poor season this year, I think we can blame it on Tate McRae. And hey, you mentioned at the top of the episode what Taylor Swift did for the Chiefs in winning the Super Bowl. If this is all a ploy to get Tate McRae in there to start dating one of the Toronto Blue Jays, and maybe that's what it takes to get us to win a World Series, then I'm all for it, my guy. Get Bo Bichette a celebrity girlfriend. Clearly Honestly. one of the most Honestly. clearly one of the most handsome players in the league. Best hair mm -hmm. in the league. Cool, mm -hmm. kind of. He's got a West Coast personality, even though he is uh, born in Florida. Kind of like the, yo, man. I think he probably, I, I, I don't think he drinks from the same Kool-Aid that a guy like Bellinger would. Or Lincecum, if you catch my drift, but still kind of a cool, <laughs> a cool kind of guy in a lot of ways. Yeah, I know, pretty clever, eh, Jesse? But not oh, quite, love that. not quite, not quite like them, but still kind of a, a cool kind of West Coast vibes with Boba Shit. Yeah, get him a celebrity girlfriend. That would be great. Speaking of which, Riley, a lot of stuff going on here. Um, yesterday was Valentine's Day, so happy Valentine's Day to all the Buds and Blue Jays listeners out there. Um, and on the theme of Valentine's Day, as Riley makes a nice heart here, I wanted to go with the players you love. 
for the 2024 season. Um, I have a few. We tweeted a few out, Riley. But I want to get your take. Who's a player you love for the 2024 season? Bo Bichette. I'll just say that we won't mm. waste too much. We won't waste too much time. I have players I like on this team, man. If it doesn't take a brain surgeon to watch six episodes of of Buds and Blue Jays and know who we favor it, and it's not purposefully. Yeah. We watch the games, man. And I'll say I'll say my true Blue Jays Valentine, man, because it's Danny Jansen. He mm-hmm. is the so unsung, so underrated. I'm going to spend another time ranting about this that he has just never played enough games to truly get his numbers up, get this guy into baseball games. He could be one of the best power hitters in all of baseball. And I'm, I'm, I might not even be talking by a little unless, you know, Sal Perez had 48 home runs and, and, and that was kind of it. We don't see a ton of power hitting catchers anymore. That could be Danny Jansen's role. Love Danny Jansen. Danny Jansen is my Valentine or whatever this segment is. Players I love for 2024, <laughs> that's him, man. That's Danny Jansen. I love him. 2021, 2, 3, 4, 26, 27, don't care. Even if he's on the M- Milwaukee Brewers, I still hope mm. that he has a successful career, man. He's a great ball and player. Danny Jansen loves you, Riley. My pick is Yusei Kikuchi. How could it not? who I am. It has, <laughs> has to be Yusei Kikuchi. Has of to course. Be. It I, is I, without I, a doubt. Yes. Um. But I want to know, Riley, if you have a player who you're given the wandering eye to, like you have your love, you're madly in love, but this somebody else on this team is just starting to catch your attention. Do you have a player like that? Well, I would be a fool to first say this. I am a very loyal person. So As, my, of eyes, my eyes do not wander, Jesse. But let's play Good man. Hy- Good man. hypothetically, we will say this. We'll say if I was to do some scouting, some searching, some looking, some perusing, some browsing, some window shopping of players. Mm. There's a guy who's been around. We got him in a trade. I liked him. He came here and he did really well last year. And that would be Mr. Jose Barrios. Okay. Yes. Interesting. Is a guy who's going to come back and have another fantastic year we were not going to talk about um 2022 i think that's really an outlier i think he's uh, works in a great pitch mix i think he's really made himself better and yeah i think he has not just caught my attention i think if you're a blue jays fan you know or you should know that he's going to come in and pitch really well this year he's a very valuable member of this team all of our pitching staff is really when it comes down to it I agree. Um, Jesse's uh, shout out there is IKF with that beard. We love a good beard. We talked on it already. Uh, IKF is good. I just hope he hits to give the wandering eye. My wandering eye is creeping into our bullpen, as it usually does. And I'm keeping an eye on what Chad Green's doing over there. He's got some stuff going on. Some impressive things are going on. That man's got a future with this team. So I'm excited to see what Chad Green is doing here. Um, some more news and notes. And I guess we can't give the wandering eye to this player anymore because he is no longer with the organization. When the Yariel Rodriguez contract went final, we had to cut somebody. And that means happy trails to our friend Otto Lopez, a guy who's been a spring training superstar for the Toronto Blue Jays over the last three seasons. He will now not be with us. He is traded to for cash considerations for to the uh, San Francisco Giants. So uh, thank you for the money, I guess. The Blue Jays just sold a person, which I feel like violates several human trafficking laws. But, uh, you know, hey, so be it in that way. Um, so long, Odo Lopez. Do you have any thoughts on uh, the move going to San Francisco? No, but uh, that's a really good way to put it. I did not think <laughs> of it like that. Um, yeah, going to play some baseball in California. I'm sure that's a lot of people's What's dreams. not to love, right? And uh, he might get a good look at a uh, an NL West team that has really faltered over the last mm-hmm. half decade. So uh, good for him. Uh, hey, I... Again, never really got a ton of MLB time at all. So it would it would be nice to see him get some playing time for the Giants. Who knows what's going to happen, man. Hopefully he has a fantastic spring and they keep him up with him. All right. And we have so much more news to get to. First, let's go to the broadcasting side as um, – Sportsnet did announce their coverage for the Toronto Blue Jays season this year. It's going to be a lot of names you already know. 
Dan, Joe, and Buck are back on TV. Blue Jay Central will be hosted by Madison, Jamie, Joe, and Caleb Joseph on Blue Jay Central, same as they had last year. Hazel May and Arden Zwelling will be continuing the on-field coverage for the Toronto Blue Jays. But the big exception, Riley, is that Ben Shulman, who is the son of Dan Shulman, will be taking over the radio broadcast along with former Canadian pitcher Chris LaRue. Ben Wagner is out. Um, we talked a lot about Ben Wagner. I have a lot of respect for Ben Wagner. I know you do too. You're a more of a radio baseball listener than I am personally, Riley. But uh, yeah, do you have a take, I guess, on um, Ben Shulman coming in and replacing uh, Ben Wagner on the radio side? Uh, Jesse, we come from a small community where the mentality of if your dad does this, then you go into this. And I think we've come into the, oh, well, let's just hire my son uh, for this. I I still kind of grieve for Ben Wagner. And if he goes on and does radio for, let's even say, the Pittsburgh Pirates, I will listen Mm -hmm. to Pittsburgh Pirates games. Maybe not every night. Maybe not every day. (laughs) But I enjoy what he does. I think he has a great, great call for the craft. I I, I hope I enjoy it. You know, Dan Shulman is fantastic for uh, television. I mean, he's he's one of the best, Jesse. And I hope that Mm -hmm. he can just get the same kind of level that was last year because – whether it was television or radio, I think the Blue Jays had some of the best people available. We had some of the best um, best personnel um, basically on hand to call those games. So, I mean, I just hope we haven't gotten worse in that aspect. I think broadcast of any kind, you know, a lot of it comes from the commentators. I cannot stand. Thank you. Thank you, Chiriso. I am a baseball <laughs> boomer, man. I <laughs> Guilty as charged, man, and I don't hate it. And I wonder where you were laughing there, Jesse. That's funny. But no, Teresa's right. I am I'm I'm miserable and I love the people I love. Ben Wagner, yep. I hope I hope basically I hope Shulman's kid can uh, you know can be adequate. I'm not I'm not hoping for a lot, but whatever. Dan Shulman, he is an already proven legend. So I might have to, you know, w- actually watch the games, be a normal person and not listen on the radio this year. Well, the TV side, Riley, will be happy to have you. It does always feel like uh, as soon as Ben Shulman went to Syracuse for broadcasting that he was going to be groomed for this position. Um, it would be hard for him to fail, but now he's got the experience. He's going to be the Blue Jays radio broadcaster. He'll even make some TV appearances in spring training as well. So we'll get a taste of him sooner rather than later. Riley, we got... Even more news, and this one might be a big one if you are planning to go to the Rogers Center this summer, which if you are listening to this show, I'd almost guarantee you definitely are. And we're getting cup holders, Riley. Hallelujah. It is happening. All seats in the 100 level will now have cup holders. I cannot tell you how many times I've been trying to shuffle over to my seat, and there's some guy who's got a beer sitting there, and it's just sitting down, and you accidentally hit it with your foot, and then you spill a beer. And I know you and I have had several pops at the Rogers Center before. Those things are like $15, $20, especially if you're double fisting them. The last thing you want is to have one of those spilled over on you. So the cup holders, A-plus from us here at Buds and Blue Jays. So now we can enjoy a cold one on a nice summer day at the Rogers Center. I mean, that's awfully nice of you that you're talking about, you know, kicking over, um, you know, other people's beers. That would suck, too. I'm more of a danger myself. You get excited and I'm worried about (laughs) kicking over my own pops. I Mm -hmm. mean, like, that's not out of the question. I get up and down and up and down and I turn and left and right and watching the ball fly, watching the ball go. People running this way and that way. Um, I could not be more excited for that. That is an absolute must. Um, and even a nice tray because there's some point at the, in the game where I do want to absolutely d- devour on some chicken fingers. So yeah, you know, buddy. It, it helps. It helps when the sauce doesn't go, you know, plummeting, you know, rows in front of me when I stand up and, and the tray goes flying. But uh, no, that's important. Don't spill spill the expensive liquids. Um, they sell at the ball diamond because that stuff is is basically the same worth as gold, especially when you're mm-hmm. in Rogers Center. 
And some more news and notes hitting the wire today. Um, first one is that Major League Baseball Commissioner Rob Manfred did announce that he will be retiring after the 2029 season and wants to have a plan for expansion in place. So not officially expansion yet in Major League Baseball, but at least a plan going together. So if we are ever going to get the Montreal Expos back, seems like it should we should know by 2029. So five years away, something to keep in mind. Maybe division realignment, which I know we've been waiting for for a forever, which would be nice. But we'll get to that a little bit later. But Riley, the one one big thing that's happened in Blue Jays land this week that our fans right now, including Stephanie Brené, wants to know, how about those black jerseys, Riley? And things are coming on about um, a City Connect jersey that the Blue Jays are going to get this year. What is your thought? What do you hope the Blue Jays do? I saw you posted something on social media about it. Tell us, Riley. What do you want to see for the Blue Jays City Connect jerseys this year? Well, Jesse, I think I've mentioned this multiple times on this show that it is, it, it's not a popular opinion. It was not a good time for the Blue Jays between 2004 to 2009, let's mm-hmm. say. I know, it might have been 2010 that they wore these because I know Batista uh, wore them uh, for his for his big year. So 2010, 2011 as well. Um, it's the black alternates, man. I mm-hmm. want some kind of concept around that. Uh, they're fantastic. Um, and the hat that we saw Espinal walk into the complex with is, is great as well. Uh, the T with the J, I really, I really don't care what cap they wear, but I love the black J's across with the blue J's head in the J that, that for me is flashy. I know that there's a lot of people, well, that's not blue J's. It's not blue. Yeah. Things that like was that. the thing. Yeah. Now we can now. Okay. City connect. Now it could be, you know, more of a concept thing and we can't, basically take the identical version of it well we can kind of tinker uh if i could if i could display my brain on screen i'd show you what i thought but i don't have an input cable that fits inside my ear so and i'm not even going to try to explain it but something with kind of the silver um says toronto could have the cn tower for the t got a blue j head on it you know there's a lot of different ways you can go i don't mind the black jerseys with the white pants. I think there definitely could be some blue options on the jersey, but I, I'm just such a fan of the black alternates, man. I, I, like, I know it's not a popular opinion. It was not a good time to be a Blue Jays fan, but as a whatever year old I was from ages 8 to 14, look at those, Jesse. Look mm-hmm. at those. Well, a little too big, but yeah, there's a Photoshop of Chris Bassett in the black jerseys compared to the one we have now on the left to the one we have on the right, including a little bit different hat. I will say I wouldn't want him to wear it all the time, but I wouldn't mind it every now and again. Getting at the black jerseys, it reminds me of my childhood and growing up as a Toronto Blue Jays fan, which uh, nostalgia sells, buddy. And that's the big thing. Nostalgia sells, and I could slap you right in the face, Jesse, if you said that that is Chris Bassett photoshopped in that jersey. No, that yeah, is- it's not. Roy Halliday, yeah, Roy Halliday it is. Canada Day, because yeah. he's wearing a Canada hat. I could, I could probably guess the year. I'm not going to, but I, I will slap you over the screen if you, <laughs> if you don't recognize Roy Halliday in two seconds, and that's you. And you're older than I am. You probably mm-hmm. watched him pitch when he wasn't very good. I got to watch the Cy Young version of Roy Halliday all the time. Holiday is one of my favorite Blue Jays of all time. Uh, Forgive me. It's getting late over here at Buds and Blue Jays. It it is, Uh, Jesse. You have been up for a long time. I, my dogs are barking. I don't even have any kind of footwear on, but we still got a lot to get to, man. We do got to get a lot to, and it's 38 minutes into the episode. Let's finally get to what we're going to talk about this episode. And that is the prospects. We're continuing our season preview. We went over our hitters. We went over the defense. We went over our pitchers. Now we're supposed to go into prospects here. Um, And before we do, Riley, I want to give you a little overview of the Toronto Blue Jays farm system. It's been a bit since we've touched on it. Um, Three major reports, uh, Bleacher Report, Baseball America, and Fangraphs all rank their top 30 farm systems across Major League Baseball. The Blue Jays are 20th at Baseball America and exactly at 23 in Bleacher Report and Fangraphs. So not very Good. And the thing that really struck out to me is uh, MLB.com did a poll of random executives across the league and asked them several 
prospect related questions, including things like which team develops the best hitters, which team develops the best pitchers, which team is really good for trading at prospects, which team drafts the best, and a couple others, those as well. The Blue Jays did not get a single vote in any of those categories. The only question the Blue Jays got a single vote in is which major league team hoards their prospects the most. And that was the Toronto Blue Jays who got some votes on that, Riley. So before we dive into deep in the details and some of the players and the names that we can look forward to in our pipeline, how do you feel about the overall state of the farm team so far? Well, to kind of go back on what you said now, I really think that our farm system um, is it is middle of the road. And I think it's only middle of the road because the way we have drafted in the amateur draft is, is very weak. Um, it's very weak. And we have also traded um, some high value picks for MLB ready type players. But I will say this, and I think this is underrated for our organization in international scouting because we sign very, very good young international players. There is a few mm -hmm. on the Blue Jays that are going to make the team regardless. And I think that that is why we're ranked as high as we are, um, you know, in the, in the farm teams. I'm not sure. I, I would be lying if I said, I loved it. We, we are a very kind of hack and slash uh, between kind of single a and triple a, and they're not a ton of young, super young 21 year olds. I mean, Relvis Martinez. Yes. He's 22. Horowitz is no spring chicken. Um, mm -hmm. you, you know, like we don't have those young arm, like those young arms, except for like maybe Ricky Tiedemann, um, you know, that are going to make the, make the majors before that they're 24 years old. Um, organizational depth is important. We don't really have any, uh, superstars currently right there. Uh, Ricky Tiedemann is a potential future superstar, but other than that, a lot of middle of the road guys. A lot of guys that I imagine down the road will be hitting seventh or eighth for lineups mm -hmm. or kind of slotted in the fifth spot for a rotation, which is still good. You can make an MLB career to that. Don't get me wrong. Just guys who probably aren't going to get a ton of all star votes, you know, into their careers. Which is a problem. The farm system, I think, is lacking that impact, that player that could be a superstar, aside from what Ricky Tiedemann could be because the stuff is so good, and what Elvis Martinez could give you with the power. There is no Vladimir Guerrero Jr. coming for this team. There is no guy. There's no Bryce Harper. There's no Mike Trout. Like There's not one here in the farm system, which is scary because when the Blue Jays developed their core, their plan, when Ross Atkins took over in 2016, he wanted to make a team that could compete. And when those players are ready to leave and go to free agency, which is coming very quickly, there would be a wave of prospects coming up ready to take their spots. That has not happened. And that is actually probably a failure from the Ross Atkins, Mark Shapiro era so far. But we can talk about that another day. Riley, I just wanted to talk about over the last decade, the first round picks the Toronto Blue Jays have had and I'm going to name this, this list here, Riley, and these names are going to leave you a sour taste in your mouth because the Blue Jays, look, the MLB draft is a crapshoot, but the Blue Jays have really missed on a lot of picks here. 2014, we had Jeff Hoffman, who we used to acquire Troy Tulowitzki in the draft, who just now is becoming a good major league reliever. Uh, Max Pentecost, I don't think ever made his major league debut. If he did, it was for a week. Um, he is not here. John Harris in 2015, TJ Zoich in 2016. In 2017, we had Logan Warmouth and Nate Pearson, who I guess has become a back-end middle reliever. You kind of expected more from Nate Pearson. 28 was Jordan Groshan, so we traded to the Marlins. 2019, we had Alec Manoa, who looked fantastic for his first few seasons, but then we saw what happened last year. The book is still out on Alec Manoa. And then the last three names, Riley, Austin Martin, who we traded for Jose Brios, Gunnar Hoagland, who we traded for Matt Chapman, and Brandon Barriera, who actually put on some bad weight. We'll talk about him later in this episode. Um, did not look so good last year. And then a prospect we just drafted this year, Arun Namala, who we'll talk about later as well. Those are some interesting names, Riley, and not the studs that we were kind of promised on draft night. No, it is not like a ton of those guys, like you said, traded away for and named a player. These are not players we we really kept around. And how many guys are on our major league roster right now? Or even 40 man for that matter. Nate Pearson, Alec Manoa. And then you can go down the list and say, even the players that we traded for, 
Austin Martin has not really been a big impact piece with the Twins. Yeah, he Roshans, might get a shot this year. He but. might. Same with Groshans as well. And I think Gunnar Hoagland, being in that athletics organization, really kind of not getting anywhere. And then guys like John Harris, that's really, uh, you know, TJ Zoic, no. Like, th those are not good first-round picks to me. Those are big misses. Again, um, a lot of it can be lucky. I mean, there's a ton of players. Mike Piazza wasn't drafted until, in, insert ridiculous round number. Rowdy Telez, you know, same thing. Yep. He was drafted almost in the, to the 40th round. So the MLB draft, Jesse, in your exact words, is a crapshoot. It's hard to find those Bryce Harper at number one. Jason Hayward, first overall pick. And he's nowhere close to the pedigree that that scouts and and players and and the media thought that he was going to be. So it really comes down to luck. Is a guy staying healthy? Is he is he growing? Is he probably is he in the right organization? You know, for mm -hmm. a lot of for for a lot of it, man. So I don't know, man. I wouldn't say we're in peril, but it is nice to have a good minor league system. Kind of takes the future off your shoulders a little bit because again. And in three years, is Miguel Geraldo ready to play Major League Third Base? I don't know, man. It's it, 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 There's a lot of variables, dude. All right, let's talk about the high-impact names, at least the names we're going to pay attention to. And we're running against the clock here, so we're going to hammer these out really quickly. The name you need to know. And if you're a Blue Jays fan, you already know this name. We've talked about him for years. We thought he was going to make an impact last season, but injuries got him. That's Ricky Tiedemann Riley, 21 years old. He was a third-round pick from uh, George West College. He's 21 years old, six foot four, 220. He throws left-handed. His fastball on the 60-80 scale is a 60. Slider is also a 60. Change-up's 55, but could work to a 60. And the command's a 40 right now, could get up to a 50. He sits between 93 and 96, but can top as high as 98. The story on Ricky Tiedemann, shoulder soreness slowed him down a lot last year, and then he had a little bit of biceps problem. I never like to see arm injuries with your young prospect, but so be it. He went up to AAA, and his electric stuff still was there. He went to the Arizona Fall League last year, and the stuff was still there. He had a healthy offseason this year, and he's going to attempt to win a rotation spot, but we think it's more likely he gets into Buffalo just because he hasn't thrown more than five innings in a start or thrown more than 84 pitches in a single start ever. So I think the Blue Jays really want to see him be able to work that inning count up, increase the limit a little bit, and see if that stuff, his 168 FIP and a 44% strikeout rate while holding hitters to a below 200 batting average, can all play up and still play over longer innings. So uh, that'll be one of the storylines to watch this spring and going into the minor league season next year. Thought on Ricky Tiedemann, Riley. Real quick, not real optimistic he'll make the rotation i expect him to make his first major league appearance this year though at some point i think that is definitely not out of the question but again try to protect this guy injuries have bugged him in the past we do not want to make that a recurring issue with a guy who could potentially work his way up to be a major league ace pitcher for the toronto blue jays and right, remember nate pearson had the best pitching stuff in the world we were talking about how he could be justin verlander He's not even going to be on our bullpen opening day, and he's healthy. So take that for what it's worth. Do not rush Ricky Tiedemann, but boy, that stuff looks good. And you can damn well be sure if Alec Manoa struggles again this season and Ricky Tiedemann's in Buffalo going six shutout innings night after night after night, we're going to be screaming to get Ricky Tiedemann up here. But uh, story for inside the season, I guess. Number two on this list, Riley, is a name we've mentioned quite a bit already. That's Orelvis Martinez. He is still just 22 years old. He feels like he's been in our farm system for forever but he's still doing it. In 2023, Riley, he did turn a corner. He lowered his strikeout rate, his swinging strike rates. He worked deeper into counts, and he stopped chasing that pitch down and away out of the zone. His OPS skyrocketed from 610 to over 1,000 on full count offerings. He is probably going to be a full-time second baseman now, which probably suits better his arm and stuff uh, going forward. And I just want to point out, Riley, 58 home runs over the last two minor league seasons. And that's where they play a lot less games. The power is real for Relvis Martinez. Um, and I like that after he had some initial struggles in the minors, he was able to bounce back and really put it all together. Um, the comp I've always given him, and I'm still going to give him to this day, is Miguel Tejada. Um, I really like that player. Um, some of the scouts give him like a Glaber Torres type comp, but I don't like the Yankees, so I'm not going to give that one. Um, Riley, how do you have a thought on uh, Relvis Martinez here? I like I like Miguel Cabrera 
Um, or, uh, um, Miguel you know, Tejada. Or yeah, sorry. <laughs> I, I love Miguel Tejada. I like Miguel Cabrera, but yeah. I love Miguel Tejada. I'm not super sold on a Ralvis Martinez, however. Uh, my only worry with him is that, and I'll use this for basically, I, I think he'll pan out, but he was, he's been in our system for, he has been in our system forever. I, I don't know if we sign him as a 16 or 17 year old Jesse, but he You're is very young. Very he young. Has, he has been here, man. He has put in work. He's been through almost all. All like all levels of our farm system, and he's he's super ready. And I think that the move to second base is a wise choice. There is still a log jam at second base. I don't know if Aurelvis Martinez gets that position. Do all of a sudden four guys have no job? Like I don't know, man. That's a that's a crazy one to think about too. I think that there is still a lot of holes in his swing, and I don't know what his average would look like over Mm -hmm. you know a good sample size of major league time or even if even if the power will will stick with him um he could you know not barrel up um as many baseballs just because of the movement on certain pitches and not really get the same kind of stick on it there's a lot of things that can go in or he could get really lucky and and top off i'm yeah, you I'm could have a not, Davis Schneider esque run, right? Like what Davis wow. Schneider had when he first got here. That was insane. I don't know. Yeah, it, it, you can't that expect that, that, of course. But yeah. no, um, I, I, I like Aurelvis Martinez. I don't love, uh, what, um, basically what I think he's going to do, and I'm pessimistic, um, which I probably shouldn't be, but I think he's you know, a basically a swing freely type of guy who plays middle infield. And I don't know if a ton of those guys really pan out. I mean, Alfonso Soriano, Miguel mm-hmm. Tejada a little bit. Uh, but no, even Nolan the, Gorman is a name I'm thinking who is in St. Nolan Louis now. Nolan Gorman. And I mean, yeah. they're decent players, but they're not, you know, top end guys. And we don't even need a right. top, top end guy. Uh, we'll, we'll get to see what he looks like. Um, but again, I, I'm I'm not super optimistic. I would be more apt to go and fill that spot with with Barger again. There's a lot of swing and m- miss with Addison Barger, but I like the defense versatility with him, and I like the lefty bat. And you know what? At the end of the day, Aurelvis Martinez is probably going to have a better career than Addison Barger in the major leagues. But for what this team needs right now, out of those two guys, I will pick Barger. I think for right now, going into the year 2024, I think the more important piece, I think the guy who's going to have more impact for this team is going to be Addison Barger. Yeah, um, and let's just let's get into Addison Barger a little bit too here now because um look the Blue Jays need power. Both these players have power. Um, Addison Barger was supposed to be the guy coming into spring last year. He was supposed to be really good, but he had an arm injury and it really hurt his bicep. But the fact that he was out in right field at the end of the year and his throwing was good makes me feel like the arm is good. Twenty four years old is Addison Barger, which means he's got not much time left in the minor leagues. It's time to put an impact on the big league things for this year. I do think if the Blue Jays are going to carry one of these guys on the bench to start the year, it's probably Addison Barger, especially if like, look, the right fielder on our team is George Springer, who is getting older, who's going to need more DH days. You're going to want a guy in there. Like we're not hearing anything about Davis Schneider playing right field. And if Biggio, who's currently hurt, can't be in right field full time. Addison Barger has a runway here. And if he hits the ground running and proves that he can hit, he has a real chance of being the Blue Jays best rookie in 2024. I, Love every bit of that, Jesse. I couldn't mm-hmm. agree more. And the I swing is beautiful. Great leg kick, great swing. Mm-hmm. That is that is a swing I know we both wish we could pull off because the mm-hmm. ball's going to get hit a ton. We would swing and miss terribly on, on, on those mechanics. It works for him. And you say right field, and I love the idea of having the option for right field as well as playing the bases in the infield. This mm-hmm. gives this gives us the kind of current Blue Jays uh, philosophy, which is, hey, the more positions you play, the more ball games you're going to get in. And George Springer is probably going, you know, get cut down on on some playing time, and even Kevin Kiermaier, for that matter. Varsho is going to be in center field a lot. The corner outfields are going to open up. Sure, Davis Schneider left field. Addison Barger could very well be in right field a few games this year, or, you know, second and third are st- still another question. There's a lot of opportunity for young players. 
And I really hope that we go with the right, if we're going to give that to the young guys, I really hope we choose the right one. In, in my opinion, without seeing any baseball in 2024 out of these guys, right out of the gate, I'm thinking Barger is the correct choice. I could be very wrong, but the way he looked last year, I have no reason to believe um, yeah, that as long as he's healthy, right? Out of the gate. Yeah, of, of course, Jesse. That's the whole thing. It's yeah. a long season, spring training, 162 games. There's going to be injuries. There's going to be guys moving up and down. You're not going to start the year the same way you finished it. If you do, you're extremely lucky. Uh, and I think Barger has a really good chance to play some, play in some key games for the Toronto Blue Jays this okay. year. We're running up against the clock here. Um, I just want to mention the name Arun Namala. Very young. Just first round pick this year. Scouts do love his raw power. Uh, he's not going to make a big league appearance this year. But a name you should know if you're a Toronto Blue Jays fan. I want to talk about some players who made a run last year and maybe try to keep it in 30 seconds or less. But Demino Palagami or whatever uh, his name is there. I, I really need to spell that correctly or pronounce that correctly. Had a big run in the Arizona Fall League. He plays third base. The power is real. He will be an invite into spring training. Looks like he's going to be good this year. Alan Roden did a lot of very nice things for the Toronto Blue Jays this year. And um, some prospect names that I like that could just be middle reliever types, but I do think could end up in a back end of a bullpen. TJ Brock, who I think has the best individual slider in the whole system, Hag and Danner. And I don't want you to forget about CJ Van Eck as well, who did start in the Arizona Fall League as well and had some impressive things after battling his injuries. Um, Riley, do you have a quick thought on any of those? Or do you want to add your own prospect, your own name of a player you think is a name to watch in the farm system this year? You kind of already did for me. I think Hag and Danner, um, I don't know if he'll get a chance. I think that he um, is going to be a good relief pitcher probably in triple a to start this year if he sees any mlb time i don't know if that means something went wrong or he could be pitching really well and we're run down with some injuries i like i like i like a homegrown relief pitcher that is something that you don't see too often and just other names I wanted to mention, Brandon Barriera, who was our fourth ranked prospect last year, put on some weight last year. We were giving him like he could be on the Ricky Tiedemann path. Um, we need to see some things from him. But was, look, reports are his weight is already down. He's gotten into better shape. His uh, his stuff still looks pretty good. So he could jump on this list next year. And let's not forget Tucker Toman either, Riley, who when he was drafted, we seemed to be very high on him. He did not hit at all last year. I would love to see Tucker Toman really take it together because we know the upside can be sky high for the hem. Um, do you have a prospect you might think disappoints this year, Riley, or have we pretty much covered the main guys? I, I think a lot of the main guys, again, I'm, I'm going Barger over Martinez. Something about Aralvis Martinez, you could mm -hmm. very well see a dip in the batting average, even at the minor league level with some big swing and miss in his games. And Barriera, yeah, I, again, if yes, he could be more on kind of a – Manoa trajectory, if you want to call it okay. that at this point, man, if, and not even at the major league level. So as a first rounder, we went through the first rounders that have not lived up to any sort of hype. Uh, hopefully that is not the case because another good left-handed pitching prospect is, is certainly very helpful. Yep. I just want to go through this last list to round out the episode here, but these are just names you should know. I'm going to name the best blank and tell you the name of the person who has these just so you have them in the memory bank here. The first one, the best hitter for average the Blue Jays have in the system is Alan Roden. Keep an eye on him. Best power hitter or Elvis Martinez, surprising nobody. Um, the best strike zone discipline is Leo Jimenez. That's a name we didn't mention, but with Otto Lopez being traded, he now fits that role. He's like 26 years old now, and his only real roster competition is Santiago Espinal. So I bet you will see some Leo Jimenez this year. Best base runner is Cam Eden, who we saw come up late last year, who was going to even be on the postseason roster. I think he was actually to come on a bit. The best overall athlete is Desan Brown who speed guy, we've seen him in spring training. We'll see him again this spring training as well. To the pitching side, best fastball, Ricky Tiedemann, surprising nobody. Best curveball is Adam Mako, who I believe was in the Gritchick trade. I might have that trade wrong, but I think he was the guy we got there. Or maybe it was the Teoscar Hernandez trade. That's um, the one. That's the one, yeah. yeah. Best slider was is Connor Cook. The best changeup, which is more like a splitter, is Rafael Sanchez. Keep that name in mind, as we know the Blue Jays love developing their splitter prospects. Best control is to a man named Fernando Perez. The best defensive catcher is a guy named Phil Clark. The best defensive infielder is Josh Kasevich, who was kind of my thought of a guy who could bust this year, but story for another date. The best arm, Addison Barger, surprising no one. And the best outfielder defensively is Cam Eden. Riley, any of those names surprise you, or does that sound about right? 
Uh, Cam Eden, I think, is a quite a bit of a value for us with uh, with the speed and athleticism uh, because I think that uh, I'm not going to call him a Terrence Gore, but to have a guy like that on a playoff roster is very, very important. Jesse, a lot of names, a lot of different ages. Yep. Alan, mm-hmm. Roden for, Alan Roden for contact really uh, surprised me. Uh, I would he have, had a big have breakout to, season last year, yeah. Which is which is fantastic. And uh, there's a lot of names to look for on that list. And some of those guys, Desan Brown, don't even know if he'll make it up to the major leagues. But he is one of our homegrown guys, and, and he's a lot of fun to watch as well. All right, well, that's going to do it for our episode here today. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Please make sure to like the video, subscribe to the channel. Thank you, everyone, who made a comment and to watch our video live. Um, numbers were growing this episode, and we love to see that. Please make sure you like, subscribe, follow the channel. Follow us on TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, anywhere you can find your podcast. You can find Buds and Blue Jays. Please make sure you stick with us during the season because we got a lot more things coming. Next episode, we're going to do a recap of the offseason, plus take a look more into spring training. What are the top storylines to follow? Who are the players we're looking forward to, et cetera, et cetera. Riley, anything else to add before we get out of here today? Uh, no. Uh, happy birthday because we won't be filming around your birthday, really. But someone Thanks, turns uh, 31 here in mm-hmm. a couple days. So that's uh, not as important as 30, but he's still getting older, ladies and gentlemen. Jesse Pearl will be 31 the next time the Buds and Blue Jays air. Um, on YouTube or your streaming platform. Jesse, happy I'm birthday. on the wrong side of 30, as I like to say. You and, uh, are. You, the podcast decra- sides you, don't de- you decrepit non-athlete. <laughs> DH, you're playing DH in South Hastings this year. Oh, God, no. My team needs me in the field, my guy. But anyways, that's a story for another day. Thank you, everybody, for watching. Please make sure we'll see you next week and uh, all that good stuff. Thanks once again. Thanks, guys.